Hello and welcome to another episode of Lowdown. Today I'm absolutely delighted to be joined by Jason Stevens, co-founder of Modern Football Group and a man with quite the footballing expertise indeed, having worked in five different continents. Jason, welcome to the show. Yeah, cheers, Connor. No, it's always a pleasure to catch up. So yeah, looking forward to the next, how long it will ever take, you know. Probably more than you, you expected, because I do like to talk. So. <laughs> <laughs> it's been quite a while, and indeed, Jason, it's been quite the journey for yourself so far, working in five different continents. Although, to, to a point, I hope I've heard everything, and may be quite familiar with your story so far. Could you just please begin by, I suppose, informing everyone listening how prominent a role football played in your upbringing? Yeah, that's a, that's a good question. I mean, to be honest, football was everything, absolutely everything. Um, you know, without going in too much detail, I lost my mum and dad when I was young. I was in foster home and, you know, back then we was allowed to play on the streets to whatever time. And, you know, our playing on the streets was with a ball. Um, didn't have a happy time in the foster home. So I was out every time I could be playing football with one or two mates or with the whole street. So... That was pretty much my life all the way through um, growing up. And then obviously with growing up with such a sport, you end up immersing yourself into it throughout your career. Um, wasn't always the case. I, I did take a little bit of a stopgap. Um, I joined the uh, armed forces for a few years and then um, come back into football afterwards. Um, but not as a full-time career, but it's always been um, a part-time um, objective. And then, um, so when I come out of the Marines, for example, I, I took a sports centre manager's job in Essex and um, I was there for nine years, but I was always doing football coaching around it and playing, of course, I was young then. Um, and then I sort of, early 2000s, I decided to, to get more involved with football projects. But ultimately, yeah, football still is the main feature of my life in, in some form, yeah. And I suppose, aside from your stint in the armed forces, Jason, there would have been very few other times where you would have received the opportunity to perhaps step off that treadmill, that footballing treadmill everybody in the industry speaks about. Once you're ingrained in the industry, it's very hard to get out of it. I suppose at any point of your career, did you get a chance to reflect and wonder in hindsight as to where you've got to today? Um, you're always reflecting, you know, whether it's, um, I'm a driven person, so I'm always reflecting. So every project that fails, it's just, uh, you know, it's just a learning curve. So I'm always looking to go for the next one. Um, and, and that was the same with my football education. Um, I wanted to immerse myself because I didn't want to be narrow minded and just leave myself to one style of football and one culture of football. So I needed to see what football was played like in South America, North America, Asia, Oceania, um, over in Australasia way, and, and in Europe and different places in Europe. So I needed to submerse myself with those different styles, methodologies and everything else to try and give me the knowledge of what I've got today. But ultimately, the game's evolving continuously. So, you know, you've got to keep yourself up to date wherever you can. And whether you do that through coaching courses or meeting people or just, you know, watching football um, from different different countries you know I'm, I'm always trying to keep up to date with it and you speak about immersing yourself in different football methodologies and different countries and their style of play i mean was that something consciously you were thinking of 20 25 years ago or is that something you kind of figured out along the way that you wanted to be curious dip your toes in there get the you know go into the deep end into like north america south america or were you just pushing your boundaries so to speak I think it was, it's a bit of everything there. You know, there's, um, I was always curious because, you know, growing up through football, the, the great Brazilian teams would always be the ones that as a young boy you wanted to emulate uh, as a player, whether it's in the park um, or looking at them winning all the World Cups with style and flair. You know, that was um, quite a, a point that drove me to go to, to Brazil. Um, but at the same time, there's been some other great teams that have won the World Cup. Um, and we look at Italy, they've won it several times. France in recent years, a couple of times now, and, and other countries that have done it. Um, so you, you can't just limit yourself to, to one style of football when so many countries are you know, challenging for the World Cup and emerging nations are coming through. And, you know, they're, they're, they're creating their own style of football as well, their own methodologies and stuff. So it's always great to submerse yourself in those as well, just to see if you can take one or two, um, I'd say, 
pockets of information to implement into your own style. Amazing. And I suppose even before all of this occurred, your first big challenge, am I correct, was at Charlton. When you were working in a youth academy there, you, you helped establish something like 100 to 150 satellite schools in the southeast of, southeast of England. I think the magnitude of the task set the precedent for whatever other challenges were to follow afterwards. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know what, it's, it's, it's always the way when you want to do something, let's try and do it the, the best that we can. And, um, you know, we had lots of FA directives at the time where kids come into the academies, they were restricted by distance or time. Um, and then, you know, I don't like, from my own experiences, I've never really liked taking children out of their own natural environments, either like playing teams on Sunday mornings. I think, you know, you've got to try and mix it up by keeping them in their environments, but at the same time, offer that expertise and coaching to help them develop. So one of the, the programs myself and um, Paul Kerbishley um, developed was the, um, the development centres, as we called them. So we stuck them in various locations around, um, well, Essex and Kent. And um, yeah, as a result of that, lots of kids used to come in and then we used to pick up the best kids, take them over to um, Charlton and then they play academy games. And then some of them would be picked for the actual academies themselves. And then... Yeah, Mike had a, a stepping stone in, in Charlton along the way, um, which was, you know, yeah, it's a good, good starting point. Fantastic. And would you say those satellite centres, Jason, were ahead of their time? I mean, you see Charlton Athletic, what they're admired for having that prestigious youth academy, that pathway from the youth team to the first team, even nowadays, even though the club is in League One. But over the years, we've seen a steady streamline of players in that pathway. And I mean, Going back 20 years, you know, it's it's hard to point towards cause and effect. You know, football is a lot more complex. But would you say the work you were doing at that time, was that the common? Was that what other academies were doing at the time? Or was it thinking outside the box between yourself and Paul? No, I think at the time that was definitely thinking outside the box because, um, you know, it's okay you having all the ideas, but you need people um, to support and believe in them as well. So. At the time, you know, Paul Gervishley was very um, instrumental in making the contacts within the club. And then Jason Morgan, who was head of the community programme, he, he was keen on it to, to adopt the, um, the principles, um, etc. So, you know, between us, yeah, it was, um, we, we saw the vision of it. Um, and then obviously everybody else is, in, in a certain ways, have, have copied um, by setting up academies and uh, coaching um, sub hubs all around, you know, so... Yeah, it was probably ahead of its time, but at the same time, the bigger brands do catch up. And because of the brands, they tend to take over. Um, you know, the other question is, what value did they offer um, in terms of player recruitment? Um, you'd have to ask the, um, the club that one to see um, what stars they managed to pull out from these development centres in the long term. You know, um, I don't think of too many, it's not more name. Of course, and I suppose initially getting back to what you said, speaking about something that sounds a bit rigid and inflexible, you know, you moved from Charlton to Sao Paulo in Brazil, which is anything but. What was that? <laughs> <laughs> by you know the first and by by means that not the last exotic transfer of your lustrous career, Jason. What was that experience like? You know, taking a lad from <laughs> the east end of London, setting up all these satellite schools, transporting them all the way over. To <laughs> Yeah, I mean, let's be fair. Why did I do that first? Well, you know, unfortunately, my personal life, I, I suffered a divorce. So I thought, you know what? This is the time to, to go and study some football. Um, I had a business in the UK, so it wasn't just that blase. Um, I managed to let that run itself, so it enabled me to, to fund my little excursion. But at the time, honestly, it was... I don't know why. I just I don't know if you would, I would do that today, but I never had any contacts. I just got on a plane and went there and thought, you know what? I'm going to knock on a few doors and see if they open. And uh, I knocked on one door. It was down in Corinthians, and they well, there was no communication. It was uh, obviously I didn't speak any Spanish, Portuguese, um, and it was just game over. And uh, then I went up to um, Sao Paulo, and um, I didn't really know anyone in the club, um, and it was. Finding, finding it hard because not many people were operate, operating even in the club during the day. And it was just like, who can I speak to? Nobody understood me. Um, so I sort of like lost a little bit of heart. And I thought, you know what, I'm over it. I'm going to enjoy it. I'm going to go and study some futsal. I'm going to go and study some football on the beach, whatever. I'm just going to try and make the most of it. Um, and then one night I was in a bar and um, 
just speaking to this guy um, and it turned out to be he was a professor at Sao Paulo University as well and one of his research um, projects at the time was studying foot cell. Um, so I'm, I'm your man, <laughs> see it, come on let me help you. And, and then that sort of entwined with a job working within the academy, looking after the youngsters and staying in the academy with the kids and teaching them English as well. Um, yeah, that was an experience. Now, it was a great experience, but it was a challenging one because the kids didn't speak English at all. Um, it was very much a communication, body language and writing things down, you know, using um, subutio type figures um, to, to try and communicate what we were trying to do. But ultimately, by the time I left, I was there for about just over eight months and um, kids were speaking good English, um, better than my um, Spanish, that was for sure. And um, <laughs> But there's some great stories in futsal and, and beach soccer along the way, in which you immerse myself with them. And to be honest, I probably learned more about football and coaching styles and leadership and um, all of that from that eight months than, than I have done um, elsewhere. I mean, that's not being ignorant to everything that I've learned, but there's some prominent moments that have stood with me ever since, you know, that stand out. But, um, yeah, really good experience. Um, but more importantly, they're the older ones as well. And I think <laughs> I think anyone that has worked abroad know that football is a, a great communicator. And um, language is not a barrier, really, um, providing you can learn to communicate in different ways. So I didn't just engage with the 10-year-olds. It wasn't my whole life there. But um, you know, I, I managed to communicate with the players. I managed to communicate with the coaches and futsal clubs and beach soccer. And believe it or not, you, you know, you're making these friendship circles and um, with limited English, with all the uh, having the same common ground of football, you know, and it's uh, it's amazing. And to be honest, that experience then gave me the um, incentive to create a style um, back in the UK. You know, at the moment, street soccer, if I say street soccer to everyone, everyone thinks, oh, yeah, that's, that's not your style. You didn't own that. And you're right, I don't own that. But what I did was create an environment for street soccer to be played in. So I created the inflatable arenas. And we, the environment we created was the music and without no coach interference, just letting the kids play like I did when I was a kid and like they do in Brazil, just let the kids play, very, very limited instruction. And we put the music on to block out the instruction, but also to act as a motivator um, and a timekeeper. And um, we took away no goalkeepers, so we just wanted everyone to be creative and obviously no one was allowed to block the goals. And uh, yeah, that ended up becoming very successful for a period of time. And so much so that I've still got a, um, a small arm operating in Qatar and we've been out there for a few years and, and doing that style of football. So, yeah, I've got a lot to thank for Brazil. Um, and it was really worth that gamble. Um, it could have been so different. If I didn't meet that uh, the professor in the, um, the bar at the time, um, then, yeah, ultimately, I would have just had a two-week holiday. <laughs> but you know what? Turns out. You know what, though? It's like life and football to be a bit cliche here now, Jason. You know, it's just a series of moments. And as you said, you were only there for eight months, but it must have taught you not only so much about football, but an awful lot about yourself, judging by the likes of it. And I mean, the way you begun that by saying you don't think you would have done that today. I mean, you engage with students, you engage with people such as myself on a frequent basis. I mean, does that kind of sadden you in a way where you look at today's crop of aspiring professionals, people trying to get into the football and industry, not willing to take that risk? No, it's, it's, you know what, I love engaging with students because they, they enjoy my stories. I'm glad somebody does because the wife's bored of them now. So um, I, I do love sharing the old stories. But the other thing is to remember, well, I always try to tell kids that this market in the UK is saturated. So, you know, you're going to have to think outside the box a little bit. And the, the world is open to football and it's open to opportunities and it's open to creativity. Because if we think that football is at its peak now, no, it's not. You know, there's so much more that's going to come in, in football. And it's down to the individuals to create their own styles, methodologies, you know, whatever whatever way they want to do, resources, um, bits and pieces. And so the kids need to understand, and I, forgive me for calling them kids because they are young adults, um, young professionals, but they, they, they do need to understand that if you limit yourself to one market, then you're not only limiting yourself to opportunities, you're limiting yourself on knowledge. And 
and for me, you know, I try to educate them to broaden their horizons. And, and pretty much every story I've got in football has come because of my own determination and making my own opportunities. I've not had too many occasions where people knock on my door um, and offer to give me a job. Um, only one occasion really where that's happened. And unfortunately, I was in the Cook Islands at the time. Um, but yeah, these young professionals, they need to be brave enough to go out into the world. And I'll, I'll have we brought the kids up to be, um, so, to have a safe factor in their own environments, their own homes, their own neck of the woods. For me, you know, where maybe I could turn around and say, look, I didn't really have a, a sense of belonging when I was young and I immersed myself young in the, in the forces. Unfortunately, you know, my first three years was under conflict. Maybe that gave me that um, confidence and freedom to just go out and explore the world and take on these, these opportunities. But listening and speaking to some other like-minded coaches, they all said the same thing, that the opportunities in the UK was limited. So therefore, you know, we had to go and, and reach out and find these opportunities. And those opportunities abroad were easier to come by. And it's quite interesting. It's, it's, it's not arrogance where a lot of the um, countries in the minor countries, the smaller countries, they actually respect the English countries. Um, and that opens a door. It doesn't necessarily open it all the way, but it opens the door for a conversation. And then it goes down to your talent and then your own philosophies and methodologies, whether you get that opportunity. But ultimately the doors will open if you've got a certain amount of experience that you've got in the UK and accompanied by the fact that you're English. Um, and I'm not too sure why the English are seen as, um, um, I'm mean, going to say that tongue in cheek because I know that we've been accredited with um, developing the game, but at the same time, you know, we look at the success of the national teams and why the English are, are so highly regarded in a lot of countries. But my journeys throughout um, the world would say, I'm going to answer that myself, um, is the work ethic that the English coaches have. You know, people in Europe, they work very hard compared to some of the other countries. And we could turn around and say, well, actually, Maybe we got it wrong. We should enjoy life more than what we should work. But um, my, my experience working in, in Italy, in Qatar, in, in the Cook Islands, they've all said the same thing. You work too hard. Um, and that's only because of the amount of hours you put in, not necessarily the quality of work, but the amount of hours that you put in. Um, when I was over in the Cook Islands, mate, their work day consisted of two, three hours. You know, and to me, I was, I was bored. I couldn't handle that. I was like, what do you mean? <laughs> Well, we're going to go and sit on the beach, we're going to go and do this. And I get that, but while I'm on my own, my family are not out with me at the moment. So I'm just going to submerse myself in, into work. But they couldn't believe how hard the English worked. I wasn't the first English coach out there. There was a guy called Drew Sherman behind um, for me, and um, he was the same mindset. You know, he was uh, another one that worked hard. And, and it seems to be the same. You know, the English coaches work really hard at what they do, and they enjoy that because you're giving back, you know, as well. Exactly. But I mean, the common thread here for me, Jason, is of course you're a hard worker, seeing that, you know, for, <laughs> firsthand with yourself, but in terms of, you know, being brave, being curious, not limiting yourself to any markets, because even after those eight months in Sao Paulo, could have been at that point where you go back to England and get comfy again in the EPPT system, in the academy system. But you end up going over to North America and you not only do a bit of work with the Portland Timbers, but also San Francisco 49ers, you know, yeah. the American Football League, the NFL, completely different sport to football or soccer as they call it up there. I mean, take us through that time. <laughs> well, actually, do you know what? I mean, again, I'm not saying I'm an innovator, or, or, but I do like to think that I can see where football was going. Um, and at the time, sports science was really on the up. And um, there were different concepts of um, strength and conditioning, speed and agility, quickness. And there was actually a company called SAQ that seemed to have been hitting um, the UK market. And it was a guy called Alan Pearson. And it was predominantly designed for rugby players. And it was just um, some, an element of fitness, sports performance for um, speed, agility, quickness. And then there was uh, another company um, in America. And... Um, Nike were sponsoring them, but they were called Spark. And that, again, in the acronym, speed, power, um, agility, re reactions, and quickness. At the time, I was an international instructor for SAQ. I come across the idea. I thought, you know, I'm going to take the courses. And then I thought, yeah, this is excellent. Put that into football. Um, 
and then saw that Spark was over in America and then undertook one of their courses and then they invited me out to um, um, initially work with uh, Michael um, Johnson's um, athletics program and uh, I'd done a couple of weeks there but it was more observation and training and then I was offered an opportunity to go and work with San Francisco 49ers so, um, you know, pre-season so um, I thought yeah, I'll take that um, what am I doing at the time when I was out there honestly nobody English and American football you, know, you can appreciate it. it's uh, not going to go down too well um, it was a bit like the other way around you know 30 years ago Americans and football coaching it was just English and American football, not going hand in hand. And mate, honestly, it was probably the most uncomfortable period I've ever experienced in the world. I just felt like, what am I doing here? Nobody wants me. And they basically gave me um, a, a third junior quarterback. Um, his name was um, Daniel Smith. And um, they just said, I'll work with him on your own. And um, yeah, you basically just get lost. We don't care what you do with him because he's only a third quarterback, a kiddo. And, I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to enjoy my three months out here. And um, I started working with him um, using the SAQ, using Spark, using performance analysis. I saw the old video analysis all coming into it. So I got all the recordings for his games. We're looking at him. I mean, listen, I'm not saying I'm an expert in American football because I'm not, but I do understand key positions and I understand the principles of um, sports intelligence and how, what, you know, um, how to develop someone's vision and, and things like that and the, their agility. And uh, yeah, it wasn't a master stroke, but by the end of that three months, he got a starting role in the first team. And he made, um, he went on and made three starting appearances as well in that season. And ultimately, they wanted me to then stay full time. I was like, what? But I didn't have a degree. I didn't have any education. So when they um, put my um, application in um, to the, uh, the to get a visa it was declined because I never really had any qualification I had an A license in football but unfortunately that was about it a couple of GCSEs but anyway that wasn't to be put off by that I was quite happy and then I went to um, back to Spark and I said how do you fancy going up to Portland Timbers you can do pre-season with the first team you know, doing exactly what you've done and I thought okay let's give it a go I mean the same story I mean that was a little bit more welcoming because it was football um, and after the six weeks I spent with them, they offered me a full-time job. Um, for some reason, I thought this is a different um, department for visas. And um, unfortunately, I got uh, rejected as well in North America because I didn't have a coaching qualification. Oh, sorry, I didn't have a degree. So I was like, this has made my mind up. So back in 2010-11, I ended up going back to university to get that piece of paper. But I was still working with um, Nike Spark. And then they got me a job with Inter Milan um, over in Italy. And I ended up um, doing that along with um, some other bits and pieces. Um, but that was, a, that was a funny story because <laughs> when I turned up there, it wasn't welcomed at all. <laughs> so the point was nobody spoke to me, nobody entertained me, even the security guard was trying to chat me out. And um, I thought, well, hold on a minute, someone sent me over here, somebody's arranged this, this must be happening. And, um, I saw this patch of grass and I had my kit with me. So I thought, I'm just going to sit down over here. And then this, um, this footballer come over to me. Um, obviously, I can't give names um, at the moment. But this footballer come up to me and he said, um, um, excuse me at the moment, I've got people coming through the uh, house. But, um, you know, can I do some coaching with you? <laughs> uh, random. But why not? Let's do something. And it, apparently, he'd been kicked out of his football session for misbehaving. And ultimately, he just wanted to do some training. So I said, OK, come on, we're going to do a session. And I just started doing some like one-on-one -on -one training, position-specific. We, we spoke about what his strengths were, what his weaknesses were, and we were just working on a few things. But I decided to put some music on in the background just to get work to encourage the motivation. Next thing, I had four or five boys all wanting to come over, so I set all these independent drills up. And by the end of it, I had nine coaches all watching from afar. Um, and then by the end of it, I got a two-year contract. So I was like... I'll take it as it comes, you know. But I could have just, you know, thrown my towel between my legs and just walked off. But at the same time, I was determined to prove a point that I'm over here for a reason, not just, to, you know, to come and see the gates of Inter Milan and disappear again. Um, but that was a good one. But it was hard again because, again, I didn't speak any Italian and they wanted me to speak English and teach the, the kids English. And it, it's quite a common thing for everywhere I've been in the world that English is that language. And, you know, it's not surprising because. English and, and Spanish make up 98% of the, the, the football landscape in terms of communication. So 
but it was an in, interesting period. Um, and then I got my third year of my degree, so I had to complete that. Um, and then I ended up doing my master's after that. And now I've got all the paperwork, but those job opportunities haven't come up again. So, <laughs> right. um, mm. uh, Who was coaching the first team during that period at Inter Milan, Jason? Um, yeah, good question. That's what we're talking about. Um, 2010, 2000, sorry, 2009, 2010. Um, yeah, man, I, I, top of my head, it's not. Um, mm. after the, Mourinho. Yeah, now. Mourinho. Was it Benitez. that time? Was it Lancini? Was it, um, or was he over in City at the time? I mean, yeah, it'd be interesting. I think it was any one of Mourinho, Rafa yeah. Benitez, or Gasparini, who's now the Atlanta manager. Yeah, he didn't mate, mate, either. Yeah, to be honest, though, mate, never had much contact with a senior team at all. They were completely trained separately. It was always, um, my point of contact was a guy called uh, David Agnelli, and, uh, and he was always um, in charge of the academies. and the groups that I was working with under 17s and 19s, um, yeah, I didn't see the first team at all. Must have been an amazing there again, experience. Though, yeah, it was because I was flying over at weekends, and that was the other bit. I say it was a two-year contract; it wasn't full time. So I was back in the UK, and then they were flying me out Friday, and then I'd come back Monday. It was, that was the sort of um, the process on that. I'd be looking after the teams and certain individuals. So if the teams were traveling away, I'd, I'd tend to um, look after individuals who were rehabbing or just players that needed to find their form again. And if the teams are at home, I'd be part of the warm-up team and, and coaching assistants and stuff like that. I wasn't a main coach or anything like that. And then I suppose at this point of the conversation, Jason, you know, if you were to look at your CV, you'd have the likes of Inter Milan on there, San Francisco 49ers, Portland Timbers, Charlton Athletic, Sao Paulo. What made you take the leap of faith to move to Qatar and work with Steve with the business startup, not only business startup Qatar, but street soccer Qatar? And you did some tremendous work, I believe, with the labor camps. I mean, during your yeah, time yeah. in Doha, how much must you have learned about yourself, not only yourself, but football during that time? Oh, mate, it's a, still an excellent experience. You know, every time I go out there, I love it. Um, but, you know, how did Qatar come about? Well, I mentioned earlier that I, I started you know, in Street Soccer Style. And, um, you know, being a passionate Liverpool fan, um, the first team that knocks on my professional team that knocks on my door is Manchester United. Um, and they said, and the foundation asked me to run some street soccer events for their um, projects, foundation projects. And then I devised their street reds using the street soccer. And um, then they wanted me to wear the old kit. And um, hey, come on, just don't draw the line here. I'm happy to develop um, street soccer, but I'm not wearing a Man United shirt. Because that would kill me. <laughs> I couldn't do it. But at the same time, you know, the, the guys up there, they, um, Dawn um, Grace Girdle, she was brilliant. And she, she uh, adopted my style. And we, we, we used to run events up there every two years. And one of the events that we was running for them, and let me just explain what the events were, because they were quite unique in themselves. So we would go around... Um, different neighborhoods and we would set these inflatable arenas up and then kids would just come and play there was no recruitment it was up to them if they wanted to come and see us and, and football as you know you can put a football pitch up anywhere people would come and play and um, we then you know word got out that we was looking to get at least um, eight different teams or three to come and play over at Old Trafford but at the same time we would then play some of the academy teams, some of the academy players, not necessarily the superstars, but some of the fringe players. And then we'd have a tournament between the streets and the academy. And um, every time, I think the, the, the three tournaments that I run now, um, every time we had three, the three, three of the four semi-finalists were made up of street teams. But ultimately, every time, the academy team ended up winning it. But a number of players got taken from the the street soccer and given opportunities into into the academy as well so it was a real worthwhile project and um on one of those events um steve um mackie was um he saw it on facebook and um he said oh, can i come up and see you and i said <laughs> he phoned me from Qatar. he said i'm interested in what you do um can you um yeah can i come and see you as so, well Matt, old trafford this weekend if you want to come up well, you know I'll put your name on the, the list and you come and have a look and he turned up and then after the day, we were like, yeah, this is, this is great for Qatar. Would you be interested in coming out? And um, it's one of those things. You didn't have the, the money to do it. We had to start, um, finance it ourselves. Um, it was starting up a business with no money whatsoever. And we managed to get the pitches um, exported out there. 
and then we created our own um, events. And a lot of the events we were doing, because we were starting the business, that like we were doing them for free. So we were trying to exploit as many different markets and to let the, um, you know, the Qatar EFA, the QSL, know that you know these are the things that could you could do for your foundation for your communities and, and then we saw a big opportunity in the labor camps um with steve's business um one of his partners at the time had um a contract for one of the labor camps and um as a result it was a free evening activity um for the workers and um mate it was probably one of the most i'd say the most rewarding moments of my career spending those nights with the, the labor camps. Um, and, you know, we moan about some of the hours that we were working. And we'd stop time around and say, we work hard, but those guys work to another level. Um, just to give you an indication, they have to get up at three o'clock every day, um, you know, to get fed, ready, transported, start work on site, half five, six o'clock, obviously because the sun's down, as you know, out there at the moment, people work while they can, but they ended up working still to late in the afternoon, peak heat, um, and then getting home, they're absolutely knackered, and underfed, so the energy levels are dropped. Um, the conditions that some of these guys live in, it's not the best. I mean, an example was, it was a bit like a mobile classroom, but without any tables in there, just bunk beds, and bunk beds are packed against each other with only enough room to sort of walk down sideways and there was one plug socket for them to share in order to get their engagement through phones and stuff and man yeah i say it's, it's it's not good it's not good it's not good out there at all and knowing that how they warmed to us doing the street soccer they absolutely loved it and we ended up staying there i did it i mean initially it was only going to be for like one and a half hours but well, when we started that project the first night, they wanted us to stay on and um, yeah, can you stay a bit longer? And we said, yeah, yeah, can you stay? Yeah, stay whatever you want. You guys, this is you. You're the ones that got to work in the morning. I can be lazy. I can stay in bed in my hotel bed. It's not a problem. Um, but we stayed up there to one o'clock in the morning. Um, bearing in mind, they're getting up again at three. Well, we had about a hundred of them just all, you know, loving it and wanting us to come back. And then we come back a couple of times, but then it got stopped. It got stopped and... Who knows what the political reasons were? You can only guess. Um, and we tried to put the program to the QSL, to the QFA, and that they saw the merits of it, but it never got any funding, you know, never got any breakthrough. Um, but ultimately, we still kept going doing different programs. And then one of the things we'd do was set up in the parks. And um, yeah, in some of the, the main tourism parks, we set street soccer up. Mate, I've never seen so many people wanting to play football. Um, we would set up at like 12 o'clock in the afternoon and I promise you two o'clock in the morning, we are still going and there will be 100, 200 people standing around these inflatable arenas playing, queuing up to just go three on three song. One song finishes, the next three on three get on. Man, it was mad. And they're all, you know, they're all enjoying it. And um, honestly, I'm real. And then we worked with schools and we worked with the, the QSL. They gave us... Um, Oh, one of the games, it was a QSL game. I love this one. I don't, I don't know if I can share the photos because we're not spurning it, but it was a, um, a league game between two of the top teams and it was quite very well um, supported out there. And um, the players, I didn't even know the works. I don't really, um, my knowledge of Qatari football as QSL football is really limited. And anyway, um, this team come up, um, this group of guys, they're all in track suits and T-shirts. And when I think about it, it was obvious that they were a football team, but at the same time, I just didn't think anything of it. And they were like, um, yeah, um, can we play? And I said, of course you can play. And you know, they were joining in, three on three, playing on, rotating right on, and it was excellent. And then suddenly there was an announcement. Um, can the first team for, um, I don't know if I remember the team was, um, can you please come to the changing rooms? Your game's going to start off in 15 minutes. They, they were the actual first team. They were doing their warm-up on the three on three street soccer pitches. They just bombed it all out. They went on and won the game, though, 3-0. Um, so it was a good, a, a good advert for warming up. Um, but, but again... Just, yeah, it was so well received. Um, but unfortunately, when it was in the peak out there, um, or, you know, just growing some momentum, I then um, got approached to become um, national ladies manager for the Cook Islands Football Association. And um, that was just sod's law. You know, football was just taking off in Qatar and I had to make a decision which one I was going to go for. And Cook Islands was too good an opportunity because one, I hadn't been at that side of the world. So I wanted to immerse myself into, into that culture as well. Steve kept the Qatar street soccer going and, you know, he still does events um, very much um, to this day. So, yeah.
I think that's another story in of itself, Jason, that infamous honeymoon to the Cook Islands that I'm sure oh. nearly everybody in UCFB by this stage is familiar with. Uh, to be honest, I've, I've not really said much this year, um, but, it, but yeah, I mean, that was so funny. Um, unfortunately, um, Vanuatu suffered a cyclone and we were going to get married out there. And um, our agent, travel agent, said, look, you can't. We're going to have to redirect you, so get married in Fiji. Um, okay, that's fine, absolutely. Pacific Islands, all beautiful out there. But however, we've got a problem with your route because we were doing a bit of a around the world family holiday at the time. So um, the route had to be changed because the flight paths weren't that natural. And after living in that area for a couple of years, it is quite ridiculous. It takes I me mean, longer to get from Cook Islands to Samoa than it does from the Cook Islands to the UK, if you can work that one out. But um, ultimately, they had to change it. And instead of... Um, we was, was going to go to Hawaii, but instead of going to Hawaii, they, they changed us to go to the Cook Islands. Again, very open to the idea, um, opportunities to see some of the Pacific Islands. Anyway, landed in the Cook Islands and decided to um, hire some bikes one day and cycle around the island. Now, the island, anyone knows Rarotonga, it's from point A all the way back round to point A, it's 20 miles in circumference. And um, unfortunately, um, well, not unfortunately, we were wanted to cycle around the whole island. But ultimately, because we went that way round, um, the football headquarters was actually right the way round. So it was about 19 and a half miles round. So it was literally, if I would have gone the other way, I would have seen it a bit quicker. But after 20 miles of cycling, eating ice cream and stopping off and dipping into the water, we come across football. And it's probably a good way, a good timing that we did because the men's national team was training. And um, I just wanted to observe it, uh, just because obviously that's what I do. And um, I was speaking to some guy, he was a local um, on the sideline. He was leaning over the railings. I, I was leaning over the railings. And I just said, you know, who's that playing over there? And um, he said, oh, it's the, the men's national team. We've got a World Cup qualifier coming up. Oh, excellent. Um, and I said, well, you ain't going to win it. <laughs> I was that blase with it and he said well what do you mean when you're going to win it I said well that style of coaching is about 20 years out of date and you know we are talking about the 2018 World Cup qualifiers yeah said, uh, you know you're not going to get very far with that um, just you know, training was going on it was just very much line drills and very much free for all five aside without no structure to it and a um, lot of barking no communication with the players you know pretty much a, I'm going to tell you what to do and end of story and I, I, and I sort of said to these, bit, you know, you shouldn't be doing it like that. And he said, well, how do you, would you do it? And I said, well, if I was doing it, I would do it like this. And he said, well, go over there and do it. Take a session from them. And I what, just walk over there and do a session. And he was like, yeah. And then my wife was in my ear going, oh, go on, old Bertie, big boy. Go on, you want to give it all, but you don't want to go out there and do it. So I had her uh, on one side. And, uh, and I thought, well, I've got to stand up now and do it. So I walked over to there and I said, I didn't even know who this guy was. I didn't know his name was Lee. So I didn't know who he was. But he just said, just tell him and say, Lee said. So I walked over onto the pitch. Everyone looked at me. And um, I just went, that man over there, <laughs> like a little kid I was. He's like, that man over there, Lee, he said I could take the session. And the head coach at the time, um, he was actually the assistant coach because the head coach at the time was actually back in England. Um, unfortunately, his um, grandfather passed away, so he had some time away. Um, and he just like bowed his head, didn't say a word, and just backed off the pitch. And then suddenly I was confronted with 26 international players looking at me to say, who the frick are you? you know, and um, so I didn't waste any time. I just said, come on, let's go. Let's get you sorted out. Uh, you've got a World Cup qualifier coming on. Let's do something. We'll work on your shape. Do something like this. Let's have a see what you've got. And 20 minutes turned into 40 minutes, turned into an hour. And then, you know, at the end of it, um, I said, look, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Um, back to you and they loved it the players were very thankful um, you know they wanted me to come back um, I was only there for a week and um, I walked back over to Lee and he said look can you come and do another session with us before before Friday and I said yeah he said come and see me in my office he said by the way I'm the president of the, the um, Cook Island Football Association and I said oh okay oh excellent um, and at the time um, I'd come away from men's football as such because even though I mean I was in Qatar and bits and pieces, I'd, I'd um, I was working in women's football. Um, I switched over because of my daughter really, and realised that she wasn't getting good coaching. And I thought, you know what, she wants to become a professional footballer. Let's you know give her everything you can. And um, I was working with West Ham as a voluntary role because the, at the time the West Ham Ladies was a an independent club. It wasn't even though we had the name, it was not part of um, West Ham. We had to pay for the name, use of the kits, and pay for the training facilities, absolutely everything. So, but 
even then the coaching was voluntary the standards were varied so i looked at that and i basically as i said to west ham you need me as a coach let me come over and um and um yeah i, I was given the job with the under 16s at the time which is the age group my daughter was but I, I when I was speaking to Lee, going back over to the Cook Islands, um, we had a conversation on that Friday. However, it wasn't straightforward because he said to me, I'll come in at nine o'clock in the morning and then um, we'll have a chat. And um, nine o'clock comes and he's nowhere to be seen. Half nine, nowhere to be seen. Ten, eleven, half eleven, nowhere to be seen. But Muggins here is still waiting. Why am I waiting? I don't know. Someone just told me to wait. So he turns up at quarter to twelve and he was like, oh, yeah, yeah, Cook Islands time, Jay. Sorry, sorry. You, you'll learn that. Learn that. I said, my I'm fuming. <laughs> you kept me waiting two and a half hours. You, you, know, you know, in our culture, you do that. That's it. You never want to speak to that person again. Um, but I waited and uh, had a conversation, and he offered me the national ladies um, senior team manager job because um, they had some big tournaments coming up, um, and he was like, "Can you take over?" But actually, he offered me the men's first team job to get them through the World Cup qualifiers. I forgot that bit, and um, he said, "Can you take them this week?" I said, I'm getting married next week in Fiji. He said, cancel it, cancel it. He said, your wife will understand. He said, I'll get you married. I'll pay for it all. You can um, get married in the Cook Islands. And um, I was like, yeah, I could do that. It's possible. And I didn't even think about it. But I went to the missus. I said, no, he's paying for the wedding to come here. We love Cook Islands. It's great. Forget Fiji, you know, all that sort of stuff. Let's just do it. And she was like, Are you serious? And I went, yeah, 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 come on. And she was like, look. If I take this away, if it was just football and Arsenal on a holiday, of course we would do it 100%. But we're flying out 10 people to Fiji and they've all booked their flights and paid for their flights. Who's going to pay for their flights to come to the Cook Islands? And I was like, ah, oh, that ain't going to happen, is it? No. So I said to Lee, look, I can't. Wait. I said, I've got people coming out, we're getting married. And I said, I'm so sorry, but I can't take your men's team. Um, so anyway, to cut a long story short, if that is possible, um, I ended up going back out later on in September, um, doing some coaching with the, the coaches and doing some other bits. And, and then I ended up flying out the tour three times, doing various other projects. And then eventually I went over to the Cook Islands um, and I ended up um, not just doing the women's team, I ended up taking the men's um, club team on the Champions League journey. We qualified for the group stages for the first time ever, which was you know, a massive achievement. And then... Um, ended up becoming technical director of the, the Cook Islands Football Association. And it was a bit of a whirlwind, all of that, and um, ended up leaving because of, unfortunately, elements of corruption, and I couldn't really tarnish myself and my career with it. So I had to pull away from it in the end. It was a shame because everything was um, perfect. You know what I mean at that time? Of course. Mm. But it's just amazing, like, if you were to, you know, go through your career, Jason, with a fine two comb, you start to see a lot of reoccurring themes. First of all, with the NFL quarterback in San Francisco, uh, with the Inter Milan Academy players now at the Cook Islands, you know, it's just jumping in at the deep end, coaching from first base principles. And then you speak from leaving the Cook Islands to go back to the UK and working in women's football, now with hashtag United, formerly of West Ham. You're clearly passionate about this area. I suppose it's shocking, although not surprising, when you speak of having even to go towards West Ham and pay for the name change, pay for your own kits for the women's team. I mean, if you look at women's football now in 2021, are you happy with the state of the game at the moment? And if not, what reforms are needed? But you can never be happy because, you know, we've got to make up for 50 years of being banned. When I say we, representing the women's game here, you know, when they were banned in 1921 and then sort of come back into the circle in 1971, but it wasn't really accepted then. And football from 71 all the way through to about 2010 for women was still, you know, poorly supported. Um, so in, in theory, they went the best part of a century without any development. And, and the disappointing thing was when it was finally accepted, I was, you know, the support from the men's game was very limited and it was very much a, well, you know, not many people are interested in football. Well, these ladies are not very good, you know. Well, if you're comparing them to the high-end male players, I, I can see all your points, but why are you doing that? Why are we comparing them to men? You know, just leave that area alone for stop, judge them in their own right. Um, and um, finally, you know, football has accepted that and they're starting to develop them in their own right. And um, look, football was... In the last couple of years for women's football has made some big gains and I think we're going to see some more big gains in the next couple of years. Um, 
are we in a country that's really supporting women's football? Um, I'd say it's probably now 65, 70% we are going that way. Um, is there a lot of work that can be done? 100%. Um, however, some of the decisions that have been made in recent years, uh, you know, has got me scratching my head. Um, for example, last year, the Premier League offered to take the women's game um, under its umbrella, under the Premier League umbrella. And um, unfortunately, the people, the women's board said no, they wanted it to be independent. They wanted it to be sustainable in its own right. It represented other values. And I get that. I get that. But how, ultimately, the Premier League is one of the biggest products on the planet. And um, if you can tap into their commercial knowledge, if you can tap into the development circles and, and think, then surely you're going to help accelerate the game a little bit further. Um, and I was a little bit surprised they said no to that um, because I said, I'm sure that could have helped accelerate the game. It didn't have to be a long-term agreement. It could have been, you know, two or three cycles, just, you know, when I say cycles, broadcasting deal cycles, um, just so that they could get their, themselves in. You know, if you look at, you know, this is, off track but if you look at what the Chinese have done in football and in order to to gain the knowledge in order to develop their league what they did was that they, they encouraged every business a major business to buy a football club in Europe and they, they strategically placed clubs in all over the top leagues and ultimately you know they the best way to learn is to submerge yourself in those environments and now we got to 2020-21 the government's called them all back again to develop their own football in their own land and if you think about it, what an excellent training tool that was to go and learn in these big clubs and now come back in and put those practices into your own environment. And that's what the women's team should have done with the Premier League. That's my own opinion anyway. It doesn't necessarily represent every, every coach or um, <laughs> well, person involved in football. But I really do think they missed an opportunity there. Um, OK, we've got a great deal on the table with Sky. I think Sky is going to help um, you know, with the exposure. It seems to be the number one platform for Premier League football. And the deal seems to be quite exciting eight million pound tied with the bbc um however the share model you know has annoyed me a little bit um, because i represent a club that's in the national league and the national leagues the feeder leagues to the fa championship and obviously the wsl and the national league has been overlooked again with no money at all and um ultimately if you want a sustainable football environment then you've got to help feed the leagues that are going to make you strong um the National League's got nothing from that deal. You know, that, that deal, £8 million deal, first of all, 25% of that deal was put towards referees' training budget. Okay, um, I get that, you know, that an element of that needs, but 25%, is that not also a responsibility of the FA to help train the referees and everything else that goes with it? Why do we need 25% of some independent sponsorship deal to do, to do that? And then the rest of the 75% is broken down into another 100%, and then WSL is getting 75% of that. And then the FA Championship's going in 25% and nothing is going to the National League. So, you know, in, in one way, one way, sorry, the, what, are you telling me that the WSL is your only product and football underneath is not getting that support? Um, that doesn't make sense to me. And, you know, there's a lot of good clubs in the National League um, up and down the country that if they had a little bit of financial support, you wouldn't have girls at that level, National League level, that a couple of years, actually, until the pandemic, the FA were branding as professional, but being professional football in the women's game, you know, a year ago, meant that a lot of players had to pay to play, not getting paid to play, not even free football. They were paying to play, and including my club, you know, um, at the time was AFC Basildon, um, we lost our sponsor. We was formerly known as CNK Basildon. The sponsor walked away. And then AFC Basildon, we had to survive. We didn't have any big sponsors. So the girls had to pay for themselves. And um, unfortunately, you know, you're not going to attract anything there. You're just providing uh, an environment for them to excel in. Um, and then <laughs> luckily, and it is all about timing and it is all about luck. And um, I see <laughs> it actually worked like this. After game one Sunday, we were winning. We've been unbeaten now for pretty much eight months of the season. And we were talking about, look, we need to go on to the next level. And how are we going to do that? Because we can't expect players to pay. And then we were sitting down having a, having a drink. And then Spencer put out a tweet um, looking for women's clubs to, to, be, um, to come on board with the hashtag brand. I made a pledge following 2019 of the World Cup that I would do something for women's football. I've decided to take on a club. 
And Hill's like, what? This, it literally happened in that moment we were talking about it. And then we um we responded to, to Spencer straight away and he got back to us literally within 20 minutes. And by the time we left that meeting, we had a meeting with Spencer planned for the next week. Um, during that week, he said he had over 112 clubs um, wanting to join up, merge with him. And then he, we was the only one he met. And then ultimately, we was the only one that he wanted. Um, and we ended up becoming part of the, the hashtag community. Um, and it is a little bit of, um, obviously, I'm from an older generation. So anything on social media is still very new to me. And at the time, everyone's going, this is great. And I'm going, Spencer? Spencer who? Hashtag. <laughs> no idea, mate. <laughs> Sorry. I ain't got a clue. It's all lost. And I went home to my kids and I was like, hashtag United. Have you heard of them? And I went, yeah, Dad. Where you been? They're sick. And I'm like, fill me in. So I spent that whole evening being educated about Spencer FC and um, hashtag and everything like that. And it, well, what a world that is. And um, now I've been part of it for the last year. I'll say that again. What a world that is. <laughs> and it's unbelievable. And it has a massive part to play in football. You know, people should really embrace it because the, the outreach that they have in terms of brand exposure, game exposure, um, it's, it's fantastic. You know, some of the things that they do, some of the brands that they immerse themselves with, some of the sponsorship deals that they're involved in, you know, that's really high-end stuff that we're talking about. Um, and in the space of literally a few hours of us being mentioned as a hashtag women's team, our social media went through the roof and we ended up becoming, I think at the time, the fourth most popular club, including the, all of the WSLs you know, on certain social media platforms. And it was like, wow, this really is interesting. And um, well, the last year, obviously, we, we, the last two seasons, we've been interrupted by COVID and um, et cetera. And this year, obviously, under the hashtag brand, again, we only played five league games and won well, four and lost one. And then we stopped again. And we only just started the first game of 2021 was um, um, literally on Sunday. We played Norwich City and had a little bit of an easy victory over there. Um, but what they do, I mean, we've got this academy series running now. So this is quite alarming stat for him. Um, so Spencer got a sponsor to put up 6K um, for the winner of a female academy series, but the same price for the men's as well. Um, that 6K is equivalent to a team reaching the FA Cup women's Sorry, the FA Cup for the women's semi-final. Um, when somebody pointed that out to me, I was like, what? You get 6K for winning the Academy Series, but you only get 6K if you reach the FA Cup semi-final. And the FA want to talk about equality. Um, they'll need to have a look at themselves first, don't they, in terms of these distributions. Yeah, it's but you it's look quite at, scary. Um, you, you know, looking from the outside in, somebody who's not involved in women's football, and for me, a lot of it seems to be you know, noise over signal, so to speak. You know, you have everybody getting involved, speaking about deals, but they very much look like short-term stop gaps, Jason. You know, it's, it's unsustainable. They're waiting for the pot to boil over before reacting. And they think, you know, when it comes to women's football too, you speak about that amalgamation with the Premier League. It seems as though it's either stubbornness on their part or there's more you know, an undercurrent of maliciousness. Ah, oh, listen, I mean, there's lots of words I could use for it, but either way, they didn't come to the right decision. Um, I know the game needs to be independent. Of course it does. And it needs to have its own values and stuff. And of course it does. But it's not to say that it couldn't have happened under the Premier League banner. I'm sure the Premier League were sensible enough and know that, you know, this product needs to grow in its own right and it can't keep being sustained by men's budgets. I get that. And you know, we all do. But at the same time, to have a helping hand to be able to develop it. I mean, because, you know, they're talking about already of this money that's coming in from Sky um, going towards uplifting the current pitches that they're playing. Because a lot of the women in WSL, they share non-league grounds and they don't have, you know, suitable playing services. So I saw a, an article by Emma Hayes, Chelsea, said, look, some of that money has got to go towards some of these other clubs in the WSL that don't have suitable facilities because we lost, you know, a lot of the programme over the Christmas period because the pitches were frozen or not suitable. So is that their job to use sponsorship money to develop pitch facilities to make sure that they've got the best facilities? You know, and no, they shouldn't be doing that. If they was with the Premier League, would there have been a, a bigger budget in place anyway that would have said, look, 
we're going to take it on. These are the things that are going to be, you know, part of the, the development strategy, and that will come from this pot. This pot goes towards whatever players, contracts, and you know, um, and and workable salaries, livable salaries, and then other pots go towards the development of the game through sports science, psychology, coaching, referee development, everything else. You know, that's needed. So yeah, they missed the trick now. And with that trick, I'm, I'm asking, have they put the game back one or two years themselves by missing that trick? You know, yes, they've got Sky and the big TV deal, but that would have come anyway, wouldn't it? Because Sky is the Premier League principal backer anyway. So, you know, to me, by making that stand, it hasn't necessarily made anything any different. But look, we'll see. The game's, in, the game's in a good place, you know. When I say in a good place, it's on the right track. You've got to remember that clubs are still losing money by funding the women's teams. It is not making money. And that's what we mean by sustainable. Can your revenues match the turnover? I mean, if we criticise the championship clubs and the men's game by spending 175% of their revenues on, on salaries and bits and pieces, that figure is probably 25% of what the women are doing at the moment, you know? So they are really undersourced in that sense. And it's taking the big clubs like the Chelsea's, the Man City's and the Arsenal's to, to put in significant amounts of money each year. So, I mean, I'm hearing that, you know, City and Chelsea are, are both putting in like four million pounds a season, you know, just to run that club, just to run that for one year. Um, when you look at it, though, in comparison to the men's, and I know we shouldn't be doing that, the money seems insignificant, but actually it is massive. And, and that sort of thing then is, is going to kill the independent clubs, you know, because the ones in that uh, women's team part of a branded club, especially those in part of a Premier League team, you know, sooner or later, they're going to be forced to be giving money to the, the women's setups anyway. Um, but the, the clubs that have their own identity, like Durham's, the, the Doncaster Bells, the hashtags, for example, um, we're never going to be able to afford to go into the, the, the professional leagues because... You know, we're not going to we're not going to find a sponsor that's going to give us four million pounds. You know, it's unrealistic, especially in the current climate. Um, so we're going to have to be accept that maybe our place is um, tier three rather than you know tier one or tier two, uh, and until that changes. You know, because if the national league are not getting any money, there's no way that gap's going to be bridged. Um, in the sense, you know, they're not going to get any pennies, and everything else is going up. And women's salaries in football is is skyrocketing. It's doubled already in one season and it's going to double again because of this sky deal and i'm very good friends with um, a, um a general manager of um, one of the wsl clubs and it's, it's ridiculous and um, some of the demands that he's getting it's not in rationale to the revenues that we've got and it's agents again you know manipulating the situation they need to understand the 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 realisms of it and the realities of what they got and understand the expenses that they got that they're still fighting you know uh, on that part and um you know let's see let's see where it all goes let's hope it ends in a positive way rather than me sounding like it's negative because you know it's still a better place than it was two years ago that's for sure of course and um, during that time you get back into women's football jason of course you assume a role at ucfb moving into academia as a lecturer in international football business and um, a lot of people in academia, you know, they don't tend, they tend to do the bare minimum. That's it. But even for the likes of yourself at UCFB, I can just say that the year I had there, you had people such as yourself willing to push the boat the whole time, willing to go above and beyond. I suppose, Jason, could you share some light or shed some light even on some of the projects and trips you've brought students on and which students have embarked upon? Yeah. I mean, when I left the Cook Islands, um, my first thought, when obviously the corruption scandal, and we haven't gone into that, and um, <laughs> maybe that's for another time, but I needed to, to get involved in, a, in something in football, I wanted to stay in football. And, um, but to be honest, I was a little bit deflated with football coaching at the time. Um, so I wanted to come and get my teeth into something else. And it was Sod's Law, um, that, I say Sod's Law, but opportunist, that UCFB was looking for a lecture in international football business. And um, uh, I thought I'd chance my arm because, one, I'm, I'm not, in theory, I'm not an academic, an academic you know i've got lots of practical experiences and immerse myself in different continents but i thought am i going to be what a university needs um you know to educate tomorrow's professionals um so i was a little bit dubious of um, whether i was actually get the role um ultimately um i did get the role and um that was funny because obviously the time difference so i was interviewing at three o'clock in the morning in cook islands and um 
um, yeah, but I managed to, to convince them to give me the job. Um, and part of the condition was that when I took it over, and running an international football business program, I want to be able to provide the students with international football experiences. You can't run an international football business program without those experiences. Otherwise, I think we're you know, selling a dead horse. And uh, so I was determined to tap into my contacts to make a great experience um, for students. And, um, and as you know, you, you joined us on one of those trips when we went to Qatar. And um, you know, I said to Steve, I was like, Steve, look, I'm bringing over some students. And I said, I want us to do everything that we've gone through, you know, working with the QFA, Aspire Academy, QSL, Lady Camp, whatever we can. Let's just see. We've got the World Cup there. Can we get on the Legacy Committee? Can we get all these people and then just preach about the good that they are doing for football out there and um, let's share it with, with the students at UCFB, those that want to come out. And um, there's a couple of hurdles to get over, but ultimately the idea, I mean, it's like any organisation, the shop floor people think it's great, the management have their reservations, and, and then it was um, yeah, a touch and go whether it was actually going to go ahead, they gave, gave it, and then suddenly we had 25 students all signed up to it um, from across the years. And obviously, from my perspective, I, was, I, I still didn't know how the, how the trip would pan out because it was tailor-made. And we're not tour operators, you know, we're just people that think that students would engage in this. But I'd say the hospitality, the generosity, the openness from everybody involved in the organisations we saw in Qatar was off a different level. Um, I mean, from your own viewpoints, um, what did you think of that trip, Connor? It was, um, for me, yeah. it looked like it was fantastic, but... Yeah, certainly so. It, it was an eye opener. I think a lot of us, you know, before getting on that plane at Heathrow, we'd said we'd be open minded and give the place a chance. Of course, and I know people still have reservations, and that's fine too. But you know, the more objective information that's coming out. But nonetheless, being on the ground, meeting with some of these committees, the Aspire Academy, the Supreme Committee for Legacy and Delivery. Uh, the Al Jazeera Institute and speaking with them, you can see that they want to do good for the game. They have a clear passion, the way they speak, the way they present themselves. And there's some stuff you'll never forget, such as Gordon Penny's speech, which was absolutely him. amazing. Yeah. And uh, the game we played against Qatar State University. <laughs> oh, thanks, mate. I thought I was going to get away with that. Yeah, I do, mate. Unfortunately, um, being an old man now, I got ruined. Um, and not only that, I, I broke my thumb in. Yeah, I was trying to do a dirty old English tactics, pulling a shirt. And then as he pulled the shirt, he um, turned and it sort of like ripped my fun apart. And then trying to catch up some of these young whippersnappers, I went for the, the almighty lunge, sliding tackle, two-footed, and um, nowhere near him. But I thought maybe I can divert him to a different angle on the goal. And um, somebody caught that fantastic moment on social media. So. Yeah, just to, correct, uh, just to correct you there, uh, Jason, I think you slid from 15, 20 yards away. <laughs> yeah, it worked, though. You didn't score. That's yeah, all I can say. Do you remember yeah. that day we were all suited and booted up? I think we yeah. were in Aldo Hill or the Supreme Committee in that particular day. So that morning for everybody who's listening, Jason and Steve, for some reason, told us to bring a change of PE clothes, let's say. Just a couple <laughs> of kits, no boots, just a couple of kits and whatnot. We're decked out to the nice. Some of us wearing suits, shirts, pants, blazers, the whole lot. <laughs> we, we leave, what was it, Algesore Institute, rock up to this football stadium, just left off, no floodlights, nothing on. Yeah. Walk up to this football pitch, we look down, and you have the Qatar State University's first team yeah. Going through bloody <laughs> proper <laughs> warm up <laughs> with yeah. a coaching staff of two or three with them, and we're just looking out at the pitch, then looking back at Jason and Steve. We're like, What's going on here? <laughs> I don't know. You know, you come on, Jace, get that game for us, get that game. I fancy a game now. <laughs> remember the team yeah. talk. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember the team talk as much, no, but I do remember. Look, we've got to embrace this opportunity and just go, let's um, set ourselves up, didn't we? Because let's be fair, we didn't even have a conversation about, you know, before we got there, what who plays football, what positions, where we're going, or whatever. So we had to literally form in that what space of 15, 20 minutes and then find kit, get changed, come out and play Qatar State University, was it champions for the last five years in a row? And um, yeah, yeah, I mean. We gave them a really good game, didn't we? We only lost one nil, didn't we? We only lost one nil. Yeah, yeah. I'm pretty sure though, if we got a result that night, Jason, we would have been extradited back to the oh, UK very night. Mate, 
Well, we would have milked it, that was for sure. And um, yeah, I mean, to be fair, that was the best result because it kept them happy. And um, we had a great time. And um, yeah, I mean, to be honest, what a great bonding uh, moment that was from everybody on that trip. Because believe it or not, even the boys that don't play football, um, you know, they, they you know, stood at their five minutes and they rose and they, they played really well. Um, yeah, and uh, like you said, it was... Uh, it was a surreal moment. You know, going back to that speech, was it arousing? Was that coaching speech that I gave, was it arousing, Connor, or was that the worst coaching speech you've ever experienced? <laughs> you got your message, true. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There was a, yeah, there was no, no, it wasn't a democratic process, that was for sure. It was just get organised and just get out there. Yeah, but, yeah, it's a good moment, though. That's over two years ago now, and the memories are still fond, but eventually all this leads to the present day and the work you're doing with modern football group yeah. and if you go into modern football group it has that slogan the same game but viewed differently how did it come about jason and what's the premise behind it well initially it was um i wanted to form a a group on social media where um we can encourage students to engage in conversation about football business matters um we could encourage the students to research um, information and share content. Um, and then one of the other ideas was it's reach out to some contacts to see if we can get them some live projects where obviously it cost the organization nothing. Um, and then hopefully we could offer a valuable service to them, but at the same time providing some real live projects to support their portfolio. So when they leave university, because at the moment it's a bit of a dog eat dog world out there. So. You know, we're looking at on average 64% of that um, age group, 18 to 24, are having degrees. So what can we do, which is a little bit different, to help them get their foot in the door? And um, especially when we are such a specific university with football business. So I want to, I want to create those um, projects for them to be able to support their dossiers with. And um, I remember speaking to a couple of other lecturers and um, um, Mark and Murad and you know, very new to UCFB, only joined this year, and um, we've got some crazy lecture going on about, come on, let's create this work project as well on top of our existing work, and um, we don't have enough time, and um, let's try and create some value to it. And initially, we put the idea out to a few students in um, UCFB, and they all engaged on it. So basically, we've got a Telegram um, group, and, um, and we started just sharing content, sharing discussion, and then speaking the idea to other people. They said, oh, that's a great idea. Can you get... Um, Get my university involved, and um, so Josh, who used to work at UCFB, is now in Deakin in Melbourne, Australia. His university a part of it, so we've got a few students from there on them. And um, Steve, with his contacts in Qatar, he's um, put it out to a couple of people. We've only got one or two on them. <clears throat> but then, subsequently, the live projects we were creating. When we've got a podcast team ourselves, um, we've got like a football insights team, um, and then we've got the projects team. Um, now. The good thing about all of this is that we guide, but we don't have anything to do with lecturers with regards to how the content should be structured, the quality of the content, um, editing in terms of podcasts or anything. So the students are literally running it behind scenes and running the, the face side of things as well. Um, and we've got some really good guests on. Um, we've only been going, what, a couple of months. And um, yeah, we've um, Daniel G, who's uh, kindly agreed to take a more active role in the group as well. Um, one of the most prominent sports lawyers, football lawyers in the industry. Um, we've got Omar from the 21st Club. Um, he's agreed to do a podcast. Um, and again, um, I think he's very keen to do some extended work. We've got a group of guys from the um, um, FAB University, Masters University, um, who have formed a group called Four Nations Consultancy. And now we're, we're doing some other projects with them. Um, and um, we just had our first project doing... Um, analyzing Mexican football in tiers two and three with a view to a potential um, club purchase from a Middle Eastern businessman. So we, 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 great because all the kids went out, researched Mexican football at the lower years and tier, sorry, and um, ended up not only educating them, but myself as well with some of the things that are going on. Because normally, let's be fair, when we go out and do these markets and you see everything, it's always regarding the top tiers. You know, it's always all what's happening in Liga MX, what's happening in the Premier League, what's happening there. How much information is really out there for the lower tiers and the minor nations? So 
to us, what an excellent educational tool that is to be able to dip into those markets. And um, I was speaking to a, a guy from Denmark the other day, and he said, look, I can get you in contact with the Faroe Islands, and you can do a project with them. Yeah, why not? Excellent. Small, small nations, they might value the input, and we might be able to get our teeth into some, some real nice projects that are going to contribute to their football um, industry. So, yeah, lots of little things are happening over there now. And um, in one way, it's becoming so successful that it's now like a another full-time job on top of a full-time job but i love it because it's what students get more out of and so going back to your original question what other football trips and experiences we're going to do so we've got qatar that's come back on again so we're going to have a run to it as soon as covid allows us um we've been tying in with ben beaker and they're waiting for us to come out because we had a trip planned for them and we had um, again another 20 students signed up to it but unfortunately covid um, cut that one down we've spoken to the luxembourg fa We've got um, Celtic uh, on there for short trips. Um, so, yeah, we've got um, a few in the pipeline um, to give these, um, these opportunities. But also, we're also going to be setting up um, Q&A sessions with uh, like evenings with a, a general manager from this club and, and, and things like that so they can network as well. So that's another skill that they need to do because, as we know, loose connections in the football industry is about you know, your career pathway and maintaining those connections. You just never know what doors can open up in the future, you know, so, and the idea is by having these students involved in the group so that when they leave university, whether they go on to do a master's at another institute, they're still involved with that group because one day when they're actually in the industry, they might have a little project and they go, do you know what? I come from that group and I contributed to that and that helped my learning development. I'm going to go back to that group and say, look, I've got this project now. I know what quality you can do. Um, and we become a trusted resource, you know, for the industry. So that's the long-term aim of it, um, and it's going okay. Uh, yeah, so you're certainly on the right path anyway, so I can justify that by um, just yeah. my membership alone in Telegram. Yeah. It's amazing what goes on on a daily basis. And oh, it's off exactly. you wake up, yeah, there's a hun <laughs> 150 messages. <laughs> it's great. Uh, just last week yeah. alone, exasperated by... What's unfolded? <laughs> oh, well, I love you know we love the Super League, don't we? It's one of those topics of conversation. Um, I think everybody at first thought the Super League was replacing the Premier League because everyone was like outraged. But you know, I think when it all calms down and we look at some of the similarities that are being proposed by the Super League to what's being proposed by this new Champions League, I think people have realised actually what was really throwing our toys out of our pram for. Um, because when we look at it and we look at the core facts, you know. Those, I won't say those 12 clubs, but those European clubs, if we look at the Barcelonas, the Atleticos, the Reals, the Inter Milans, and the Juventuses and stuff, you know, they do all qualify for the Champions League year after year because their league's not competitive enough. Um, in England, it's very competitive, and we've got six teams fighting for four spaces. So I get it why there was, you know, there's, those six shouldn't have a God given right because English football doesn't dictate. Um, but in European markets, there's no competitive balance in their league. So therefore, those leagues have, you know, they've either won it for like 10 years in a row or, and those clubs are all qualified. So certain clubs probably would always get into the Champions League anyway without that Super League thing. But I get it, you know, ultimately you can't take away that opportunity <coughs> for clubs to be able to get into the industry. Um, sorry, into the Champions League. But my viewpoint on that is actually you've got more likelihood of success or another team getting into the Champions League than you have um, with the current system. Um, because if you've got six teams fighting for four spaces, then that seventh team is going to find it very hard to get in. I know we've got uh, an outlier this season with potentially Leicester and West Ham um, fighting for those places. But if one of them does make it, fantastic. But Leicester wouldn't be a surprise, would it? Because they've done it before in five years, um, probably more so um, than some of the other clubs that are in there at the moment. But, you know, really, um, how often do the small clubs actually come through, you know, if you think about it? Are those, I mean, there was a great stat the other day I saw. Since 1999 to 2010, there was 136 clubs that had entered the Champions League competition. But since 2010 to 2020, only 24 different new teams have entered the, the competition. So are we not creating that? It's coming anyway, isn't it? Whether the Champions Super League is five years too early, I don't know. 
that the other side is, Connor. You know, you've got FIFA and UEFA agreeing to, you know, in principle, letting the MLS and the Liga MX merge. You've got Belgium and Holland at the moment very close to merging their leagues. You've got the African continent creating a super league. Um, you've got um, the Atlantic League, which is involved in Scotland, Portugal, and, and, and some others. You've got the Baltic League, which is all under feasibility study, mixing some of the Russians, the Estonians, Ukrainians, and um, Scandinavian countries. So, hold on a minute. What's the difference here? You know, are we not going to go down that way anyway? You know, um, sooner or later. But at the moment, I suppose, in my eyes, I didn't think they had any intention of doing it now. I think I thought it was a very clever bit of research by those brands. Um, if you look at it, there was no PR statements from them. There was no branded logo, no website, no nothing. It was just an alleged that they've got this contract that they've all agreed to. They've all released a statement, the eve of the Champions League being um, the new structure being announced, and clearly they don't agree with that. And then by you know, announcing it, you've got all this backlash from the fans, from professionals, from industries, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And what have they unearthed? Well, they've actually unearthed two things. One, you need to maintain the competitive balance, so the, the right for people to promote and get into it. And two, you know, when we look at it, you know, we've got to have make sure that the ecosystem is financially supported. They're the two big um, things that have come out of this. So. For me, they probably saved themselves six months of research by two days of publicity. Now they know what they've got to do. So when they do relaunch this, and it, you know, I won't be surprised if it's again in 2024, because that seems to be the, the big date that everyone is setting for these leagues, the broadcasting deals and everything else like that. And it could never have launched in the summer anyway, because of the, 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 the clubs have all tied up to the current UEFA um, Champions League deal anyway. So it was never going to happen at the moment. I just think it's a very clever tactic by those clubs to, un to understand what the real public perception was of it. And they've got that now. And ultimately now they can just use that to, to go again. And they will go again. I spoke to a, a director at Arsenal um, on Friday and the last words he said was, this is not dead. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. Let's see where that goes. Um, Certainly. I mean, I think we speak about game theory the whole time when it comes to stuff like geopolitics and games such as chess. But I think if you were to ever look for a compelling case study as to what that looks like in football, certainly the European Super League, which is another podcast in of itself, Jason. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. But to close, oh, yeah. to close, Jason, somebody like yourself, who's worked right in five different continents, multiple facets of the game from grassroots already, you know, all the way up to the top of the professional game. You're somebody who engages with students on a daily basis. And obviously you're a great resource for those students. If somebody was to approach you in an elevator and they had 30 seconds to give you a pitch, right? And if you were to employ them, be it for modern football group, hashtag United or anyone, what would you like to hear within those 30 seconds? Um. That's quite an interesting question because you know what I'm like and from this podcast yourself, um, 30 seconds is not enough for me. <laughs> you know, there's, there's so many messages that I would want to get out there and to receive. And I think from the kids' point of view, I think you've just got to be open-minded. You know, um, if I'm coming to the university um, to learn, I'm open-minded, I'm open to opportunities and I'm prepared to, to take a, a leap of faith um, and more importantly, I'd say to them, be creative and innovative. Um, because if you've, if you've got projects that you believe that are going to work in the industry, then present them. Because I promise you now, there's many things out there that they don't see the obvious. And I'll give you a case example. Um, <laughs> last year, I put um, a proposal forward to Sporting Lisbon um, and said, look, you're one of the best brands in the world for one, your academies. Your academies have been very successful over the years, produced a whole the start, but you're also very good on the futsal front. But why aren't you promoting the futsal brands across Europe, across the world? You know, you're very successful. At the time, they just won the UEFA Champions League as well. So why aren't you promoting that? And um, I was speaking to the international business manager. And he went, I don't know. I've never thought of it. Um, however, I love your idea. W will you help me um, deliver this? So um, we ended up um, you know, working together for a few months on putting a plan in place, but then 
COVID happened, and unfortunately, the club had to make some changes, and uh, unfortunately, he lost his job. Um, but ultimately, now he's set up as a private entity, and he's taken on my plan. And now, you know, this is going to sound like uh, uh, traitors, but now the plans with Benfica, and um, Benfica have now adopted it. And funny enough, tomorrow morning at ten o'clock, we um, we're going to get the green light to become um, develop um, their futsal brand globally. Um, so I'm really looking forward to that one. But again, it's having that foresight. Um, don't, you know, going back to that, look, don't look at the industry as it is, look at what it could be, you know, and um, be open-minded to engage with your own ideas because, you know, ultimately their, their evolution, their thought processes are tomorrow's football vision anyway. You don't need 20 years of experience before you can put that in place. You know, use it now, whatever you've got, um, and start building upon it. I mean, there's a great example with the, the, the guy that um, developed Red Bull Wings book. He's a first year student at Lancaster University, and he decided to write about the Red Bull um, franchise. I mean, that book's been very, very popular. Um, and Again, it's just his own innovative idea. And now from that, he's going to you know, extend that to other things. And again, he's one of the, the guests, the first guests that we actually got on the podcast, actually, to join him. So um, I'm looking forward to, uh, yeah, to seeing where that goes as well. So, look, yeah, my advice is, you know, again, be innovative. Don't be scared to develop your ideas, um, but be open-minded and be prepared to take those opportunities overseas because they are there. Um, but you have to go and get it. No one's going to come knocking on your door. Do you know what I mean? You have to put yourself out there. Like you are, Connor, you know, like yours. You know, you're very proactive. You're in Dubai at the moment. And, um, you know, it didn't quite work out with the job that you're doing, but you've taken opportunities and now you're you're doing your own thing and you've got some really good things going. Um, you know, and someone that i am always got my eye on to see, you know, how your career is padding out, you know? I mean, you're definitely that type of person. You know, you're in the same mould set, really, as myself. So... It's a pleasure to see how your, you know, your how your career is developing. Yeah, listen, I really do appreciate the kind words, Jason. But um, we should do this more often. In fact, you know, it's been great to catch up, renew acquaintances, so to speak. I think yeah, yeah. there's multiple spin-off podcasts we could do on the Qatar <laughs> trip, the European Super League, amongst many other things. Yeah. But Jason, should anyone wish to get more information about Modern Football Group or some of the projects or work? you're indeed doing where can i put them in touch yeah i mean, I mean yeah just given my normal email which is j.stevens at ucfd.com that's my work email and i tend to channel everything into there anyway um if i was to give you all the other little emails it would be a little bit time consuming but yeah just on that send them any inquiries or anyone just wants a conversation um to try and extend on what some of the points that we've um, raised and it'd be great I and mean, if anyone's got any projects for the modern football group, fantastic. You know, we've got a, a good resource base. We've got some great future professionals. Um, we've got a number of people that are in industry on there as well. So, yeah, it's, um, yeah, it's a good thing. And that's a voluntary project as well. It's not something that we're doing to make money off. You know, it is a voluntary thing because we believe in what we're doing. So any support that we can get in terms of the project is fantastic. Yeah. Exactly. Anyways, Jason, top man, thanks for coming on. Wish you all the best with the upcoming projects. Keep in touch and we'll definitely have to get you on a podcast again soon. Absolutely, mate. I'll be in another country soon, so we can extend the stories. <laughs> Brilliant. Thanks, thank Jason. You. Yeah, take care, mate.